Hello and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged, this time coming from just outside Pyeongchang where the uh, Winter Olympics are here in Korea. Uh, I'm going to be test driving this. This is the Hyundai Nexo, which is a hydrogen fuel cell small SUV. It's really nice. I like the colour. It's got lots of seats <laughs> for human beings to sit in, like cars do. It's got retracting door handles, which are really cool. It's very spacious and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in the back first, because I always forget to get in the back. I've, I've got my special winter coat on, it's really nice. So it is a really, really roomy car. Oh, it is really nice in the back. In a way, this is like a second generation of, the, of a hydrogen fuel cell car that Hyundai have made. The, the, the one we tried before, we test drove in the UK, the, the iX35 had one really big hydrogen tank in the back, which kind of took up some space. This is repackaged completely differently. It's got three small tanks that are underneath here. So you've just got lots more room in the, in the car in general. The um, trunk space, oh, it's very impressive. Considering what this car's got in it, I mean, it's got loads of room in the back. That is fantastic. That's a really big difference because it's, it's just so different. I mean, it's so different, and yet in many ways it's very similar. So that is a hydrogen fuel cell stack underneath there, this, and all the, all the electronics that go with it. The actual motor, you can't see, is right down the bottom. The motor's only like the size of a big melon. It's quite small. And all this is the, the, the hydrogen fuel cell, so the air comes in the front when you're driving along, mixes with the hydrogen, which is coming in from the back, produces electricity in here. <laughs> you can actually see that there is the front of the fuel cell, so that all the fuel cells are running along that, and that produces electricity that powers the motor. There's also a, a battery pack for, to, to balance up the power that's under the back there, and then all that comes out of the back is incredibly clean air and water. But it's beautifully packaged together, and this is actually smaller. The whole unit is actually smaller. They are shrinking this unit down, smaller than in the original one. But I'm just going to reverse out of this sparking place using the extraordinary reversing cameras. The technology in this car is I don't know how else to describe it other than bloody brilliant. We're on a, um, a Korean freeway. We're just going past a hydrogen fueling station there, which we didn't need, but it's there. And I'm very glad that I had a bit of time to drive this car uh, without being filmed on um, Korean freeways because it was a, marginally challenging at times. But it, once it's going, it's such an easy car to drive. It has really nice adaptive cruise control, lane control features. That works as well as Tesla Autopilot. And I, and I think that's saying something because I think that I'm very used to the Tesla Autopilot. I'm just now making sure I'm going in the right lanes because the lanes have different colored stripes in and I don't know what that means. Uh, I know it does. We need to go that way, don't we? But there you go. There's another thing. Brilliant, brilliant. When you indicate, you get this image on the screen which is showing your blind spot so you can tell I hope we've done the right thing there we have phew so we had an amazing presentation this morning that was genuinely really interesting about hydrogen fuel cells the future of hydrogen how Hyundai sees this technology developing this effectively is the second generation because if you scroll back through previous episodes you'll see that we did test drive the iX35, which is of which there are numerous examples in the UK, which is a hydrogen fuel cell, small SUV, similar vehicle, but this is clearly a next generation vehicle. It's so much better. The range in this car is on a full tank of hydrogen uh, around 600 kilometers, which is 370 miles, 400 miles, somewhere around that range on one tank. It takes five minutes to fill the tank, five minutes. Some of the really, the, the things that really stuck in my mind when I heard about them, which I've already kind of known, but I think it's really important stuff, is that this vehicle has to use the air, which it mixes with hydrogen in the fuel cell, which is in front of me, and it has to filter that air. That air has to be very clean when it goes into the fuel cell. And then what comes out is even cleaner. So what you're doing is, like, I'm following this big diesel truck. I'm sucking in air from that, uh, cleaning it, and then releasing it much, much cleaner. 99.9% .9 of particulates, dust, muck, gases are all removed from that. So what you're actually doing is cleaning the air as you drive along. The exact opposite <laughs> of a, a traditional fossil burning car. I mean, that is, it is a, a 
brilliant bit of technology. So all that comes out the back is very, very clean air and water. And of course, when I mentioned on the Twitters uh, about driving a hydrogen fuel cell car, and then there was a long discussion, which I scrolled through last night in my jet lagged haze, about how much water comes out of the car. And is in it going to be. In 700 meters, ah, moving camera zone. Oh, Speed limit is 100 ooh. kilometers per hour. That is a traditional Korean accent. 100 kilometers per hour. <laughs> if there was like a million hydrogen fuel cell cars, would the, would the roads be soaking wet? And, and, uh, and then when, there's an, when it gets cold, it would just be into a massive sheet of ice and there'd be massive carnage. That's the instant thought of anyone who, who, who thinks about it. Here's a new technology. What is the absolute worst possible thing that can happen? That is called normal human psychology. So someone else on Twitter then worked out how much, how much water comes out of an average hydrogen fuel cell car, multiplied it by 100,000, and it, what it, equivalent, it was the equivalent of a very light rain shower, summer rain shower. Hyundai are, are, I think, doing a really clever thing. They're doing all of them. So they're doing hybrids, plug-in hybrids, pure electric, and hydrogen fuel cell. So that's the next slight negative is, we've just been past a hydrogen refueling station on a freeway in the middle of Korea, but there's not that many. I think there's four or five that you can use in this country, So it's, and they need about 100. So, you know, that's clearly, if you are gonna buy one of these cars, a fairly major restriction. Um, you can't refuel it at home, you, can't, you can only refuel it with hydrogen and you can only use hydrogen filling stations. So in that sense, there's a lot of development got to go on, but other countries are doing an enormous amount. So there are, I think there's 30 or 40 hydrogen stations in California. There is something about a similar number in Germany and Germany are installing another 100 this year. And that starts to push it to where it is a plausible vehicle to, to purchase or lease because you can refuel it. Where does that hydrogen come from? That's always been my argument. Well, the, the whole drive of this is that it's using renewables, excess renewables, of which there is a lot at various times of the year, because you can store it as hydrogen for as long as you want. You know, certainly many months you can store it, maybe not for 10 years, but you wouldn't want to do that. But the whole, uh, Germany is a really good example with a very high installation of renewables they're producing vastly more electricity in the summer than they need and vastly less electricity uh, uh, in the winter than they need. And therefore, you really want to shift that power base from summer to winter. This is just for powering the, the, the cities and towns. This isn't for cars. But clearly, the, I think the knock-on effect of more hydrogen vehicles will be more hydrogen infrastructure of all sorts, not just for cars, but for running power stations. So you can store... Uh, excess renewable electri electricity as hydrogen for a long time, then use it through fuel cells to generate electricity in the winter when you need it, or heat when you need it, and likewise, you can fuel cars with it. Well, that's that. It's that when you see an integrated system emerging, is when this sort of stuff really starts to make sense. And the fact that there are people investing and, and researching and developing these cars is really, really important. So I think that that's the kind of the big picture. And the small picture is, I'm in a car that keeps going bing, bing, and it's doing all sorts of things. Well, I'm not really driving it. I mean, I could go faster than this, but we're stuck behind a truck and it makes it quite relaxing for me. I don't, I'm not having to sort of check my mirrors all the time to make sure I'm doing anything wrong. There's some in, intriguing things that, about hydrogen fuel cells that may not be apparent initially. This vehicle, if it's in minus 30 degrees centigrade weather, which would be like northern Norway in the winter. It takes 30 seconds to start. So I'm having a little bit of fun now because we've got a very long uh, freeway drive. Uh, I've got the energy flow screen up on the main screen there, which has given me an enormous amount of profound pleasure. So I can see what's going on with the, the hydrogen fuel cell producing electricity that's going to the motor. But now, because we're going downhill, oh, we're going downhill, so we've got regenerative braking, that, which is adaptive. You can have it on or off. It's very much like the Ionic. It's got three levels. And while I'm going downhill, 
that is sending power from the motor to the battery pack because although this is a hydrogen fuel cell car it does have a battery pack uh, so that's recharging the batteries at the moment and now if I accelerate if I accelerate hard um, oh my god there's so many variants it's just fabulous so you can have power going directly from the fuel cell into the batteries you can also have power going from the wheels as you slow down going into the batteries it basically is designed to maximize the the, the most efficient use of, of hydrogen if I so now I'm going to overtake and we're going up a slight hill so I'm going to apply more acceleration then you get all the power from the battery that you can all the power from the hydrogen fuel cell to give you that extra bit of power and that is obviously constantly changing all the time it's you know you're not aware of it as a driver if you have got that screen on you wouldn't know any of that was happening I've been driving for, I don't know how far we've done so far, a couple of hundred kilometres. I've still got 409 kilometres of hydrogen fuel left, which is, you know, not bad really, is it? And I've had a constant series of pings all the way along, and I don't know why. So I like this screen too. So we've purified 82.1 somethings, kilolitres, I guess. I've never seen KL before. And that is the amount of pu air purified, is the amount breathed by five adults in one day. So we've, we've actually purified that. It's a really difficult thing to get your head around. We haven't just not used it or not made it dirtier. We've sucked it in, purified it, and, and sent it out the back. So the air behind this car is fractionally cleaner than it was before we passed. So we're, uh, we're doing, averaging 94.2 kilometers per kilogram of hydrogen. So one of the things that, I, that my, really caught my ears this morning uh, was the uh, relative efficiency of hydrogen fuel cells. So if you use CNG, compressed natural gas, in a internal combustion engine car, which has been done many times, the uh, efficiency in the vehicle is about 25%. So it, it, you know, effectively 75% of the gas you put in is not used to move the vehicle, it's used to run the engine. If you then put hydrogen that you extract from natural gas, for instance, uh, which is how most commercially available hydrogen is produced. When you use it in a hydrogen fuel cell car, it's 50% efficient. So I think the other things that I really like about this, the, the drive unit, the fuel cell, the, the tanks in this vehicle, if you just double them up, that's what they've put in the bus. So it's not like completely different components, it's exactly the same, motors, fuel cell, electronics, but you just have more than one. So the one of the kind of urban uh, buses they're making has six fuel tanks in, as opposed to three. It has double the motors uh, driving the axle. Uh, you know, really simple way of, of, of mass manufacturing these units for various different uses. That was one really good thing. And the other one, which I think is really interesting, which I haven't heard a lot of talk about, is this vehicle, when it's going along like now, is producing electricity from air and and hydrogen well you can run the fuel cell when the vehicle isn't driving and it will generate electricity that you could run your house with 10 kilowatts that's a lot of electricity that means you know the average uh, house in the UK uses between two and six kilowatts when it's doing everything with tellies and washing machines and tumble dryers and lights so if a, a car can produce 10 kilowatts uh, you know at an absolute static amount of electricity just pumping out 10 kilowatts then that's enough to run a big house or you know a couple of houses and one of the one of the suggestions was if you had 10,000 fuel cell cars parked in their ha parked at home connected to the house you're actually producing one gigawatt now you wouldn't want to do that all the time and it, no one's suggesting that you know you just you know you get home and you run your fuel cell car to power the country but the fact that it is also a very valid and powerful generator set effectively it's a 10 kilowatt generator the the possibilities of how that could be used in future are really very interesting very like battery cars it's a way of moving energy around and i think we will increasingly see that that cars are basically 
mobile energy storage systems, and that could be either as a battery or as a, a hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen tank. We spent a night in the hotel in Pyongyang, and in the morning there were a load of buses waiting to take us up the mountain. Oh, that is so typical. You know, we're outside the hotel, there's loads of coaches lined up to take us up to Pyeongchang, the Olympic site. You know, that's the sort of thing I do every day. And here we are, outside the back of a big coach, and it's ticking over to keep the heating on, and it's pumping out loads of filthy fumes. You know, these big coaches are a massive contributor to urban pollution. I mean, look at that, you can see it. Look at that. Hang on. Yeah, that doesn't smell. That's just steam. Oh my God. <laughs> Fake surprise. It's a hydrogen fuel cell bus. This is an executive coach, so this is pretty posh. Ah, there we go. We sat back and relaxed as the incredibly smooth bus took us through Pyongyang and up to the Alpensia Olympic Park, where we were treated to a brief display of big air, courtesy of some young men in baggy winter clothing, defying logic and safety with a snowboard attached to their feet. Terrifying. It was a bit of a panic to get on the train, but we made it, and we were swept back to Seoul at bullet train speed. So I'd like to thank Hyundai for taking us to South Korea. There's a couple more episodes about our adventures there coming soon. Please subscribe to Fully Charged and have a look at the Patreon link if you want to, no pressure. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching. Bye, see you. <laughs>